Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome to Transport Demand Management and Sustainable Urban Mobility in Digital Age session of the Transport and Climate Change Conference. Whew, <laughs> I practiced that. Uh, <coughs> my name is Andre Fritzler. I am a city coordinator at Cities Finance Facility here at GIZ, where we help cities to bring their climate relevant projects to financing. We all witnessed the change in travel patterns before, but much more prominent during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. There is much less traffic going into the cities and returning in the afternoon. Unsurprisingly, most people used the pandemic, um, used the opportunity during the pandemic to avoid the traffic jams and use alternative meeting meetings. So why do I think this is a lasting behavioral change? A knowledge worker today is using less time in crafting a project like a report or a drawing or, a, or an Excel spreadsheet, but much more in exchanging their ideas and knowledge in workshops, in conferences just like this one. All these meetings are constantly changing locations in citywide, in worldwide, in nationwide. They're always changing. Working in transit, or in cafes, or in different meeting rooms, becomes the new norm. Associated infrastructure, such as free and fast internet, but also catering and personalized traffic demand, uh, travel demand, are the new opportunities. This session seeks to create an exchange on good practices, innovative ideas, using digital means and approaches to reduce use of motorized transport in the cities. So I hand over to my colleague Carolina, who is, in my opinion, one of the best experts worldwide on non-motorized traffic, who will join us from Bogota, and she will guide you through our agenda and our esteemed speakers. Thank you, Andre. Good morning in the side of the world. Good afternoon in Berlin. I am Carolina Hernandez, Senior Project Advisor of the C40 Cities Finance Facility in Colombia, and I'm very, very pleased to be your co-moderator in today's session on transport demand management and sustainable mobility in the digital era. One of the key questions for today's workshop is what other digital technologies emerging or available that can help to completely avoid the use of private motorized vehicles or helps restructure transit patterns in our cities so that other options of mobility get more attractive? To answer these questions, we have a great lineup in today's agenda covering different topics. We have divided the whole session in three blocks, but first we are having the opening words by Mrs. Miriam Ross from the German Environmental Agency. Then we start with the first block of city presentations on good practices, where we are honored to have representatives from Bogota, Colombia, Lahti in Finland, and Morelia in Mexico. The second block will have the pitches on digital solutions for urban transport. Well, we'll have, we will have Paula Ruo from Fertig, Philippe Radim from Urban Radar, and Denise Paz from Trophy Association. And finally, we are going to close this set by welcoming my dear Professor Dick Heinrichs, who's going to talk from the finance sector point of view. And after all these interesting presentations, we are opening the floor for a novel discussion and some questions from the public. So thank you and welcome everybody from all over the world. And now I'm handing over to you, Andre. Thank you, Carolina. So we are super excited to welcome Miriam Dross to share her vision of, uh, of future cities. Thank you so much, Andre, and um, a warm welcome from me as well in the name of the German Environment Agency. And I'd like to give an overview of the um, German Environment Agency's Tomorrow's Cities. So the 21st century is a century of cities. More than half of the world's population lives in cities. And by 2050, it will be 75%. So more than 2.5 billion more than today. 
cities have to deal with many different issues with strong environmental impacts. Let me give you just two examples. Climate protection and adaptation in cities. Cities account for 80% of global energy consumption and for 60% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So they face two challenges at the same time, to reduce emissions and to adapt to climate change at the same time. And then there's air quality and noise protection issues. Traffic in cities affects people and the environment. So for example, 75% of the population in Germany feels disturbed or annoyed by road traffic noise. And there's air pollution in cities that is still too high. So we need to strengthen the link between urban development and environmental protection. But it is possible to create an urban environment with environmentally friendly transport, low noise levels, green spaces, and a functional mix. An environment with less traffic, fewer cars, and fewer health and climate hazards. Livable cities provide green areas, compact housing, and space for walking, cycling, and social activities. The German Environment Agency developed the vision of tomorrow's cities and proposed a set of measures how to achieve it. The vision shows pathways to sustainable urban mobility in the future. One key point is to decrease the number of cars with a long-term target of 150 cars per 1,000 inhabitants. This is pretty ambitious because currently in Germany the density is 580 cars per 1,000 inhabitants. So the vision embraces many different aspects of the life in a city. It's about a city that is compact, space-saving and traffic avoidable, where important destinations can be reached at short distance, where transport does not emit pollutants or greenhouse gases, that is future-friendly and resource efficient. And in the city of tomorrow, people are, are barrier-free mobile. The city of tomorrow is green, and its residential districts are attractive, functionally mixed, and affordable. In this city, public transport, pedestrians, and bicycles have priority. Mobility is reliably financed and affordable for all. The traffic tempo is adapted to urban life. Residents are best protected from noise, and the principle of using instead of owning applies to the car. Citizenship, administration, and region are cooperatively involved in planning, and the feeling of security is great not only in road traffic. Tomorrow cities proposed a whole set of measures for different levels of government. They are structured around the three principles, shift, avoid, and improve. And they include um, the promotion of walking and cycling, integrated mobility services, a speed limit of 30 kilometers per hour in the city, and very important, parking management systems. Tomorrow's Cities was followed up by a publication um, of, a, of a joint GIZ Uber project that looked at reverse innovations connected to the ideas of tomorrow's cities. Reverse innovations that are concepts or ideas that are adopted first in the developing world or in emerging markets and inspire urban transport in developed economies. The report presents good examples worldwide. For example, smart scooters that were introduced in Taiwan first and then later in Berlin. Now, where does digitalization come into play here? There are already a large number of ICT-based technological solutions available, but they are mostly used by individual cities or companies. 
positive environmental effects such as climate relief, energy efficiency and resource conservation are vital promises of the smart city. But currently, they are not drivers for implementing smart concepts or measures. Digitalization until today is strongly viewed from a technological renewal perspective. The actual need for an ecological transformation is not yet perceived in urban practice. But smart concepts that serve the environment and climate protection is what we really need. And municipalities need tailor-made digital tools for integrated planning and processing. So, Thank you for your attention, and I'm very curious what comes next. Vivian, thanks a lot. I'm very much looking forward to live in this city together with my kids <laughs> one day. But um, now we, let's have a look what the city is today already doing in uh, progressing the sustainable agenda. So, um, Carolina, please uh, introduce your next guest. Thank you very much, uh, Claude Ross, for your opening and for sharing also the vision of Tomorrow's Cities, where digitalization in urban development is presented as a key and a strong perspective towards uh, advancing uh, to a smart city. Now we are going to start with the first block of the main set. We are presenting you good practices from cities so we can all frame the discussion based on actual experiences about traffic demand management and the tools cities are using to be innovative in this area. So let me introduce you to our first guest. He is Juan Esteban Martinez, Under Secretary of Policy in the Secretary of Mobility in Bogota, Colombia. Uh, thank you for joining us today and welcome, Juan Esteban. Thank you very much, Carolina and everyone. Uh, my name is, as Carolina says, Juan Esteban Martinez Ruiz, under Secretary of Public Mobility uh, Policy. And so I'm going to show you, I don't know, uh, Carolina, if you are going, do, do you have the presentation? Yes, Juan. We are going to share the presentation, yes. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to show you a little bit what we are going, what are we doing right now, uh, trying to uh, reduce the use of cars in our city. So next, please. So Bogota uh, has about seven, 0.5 million inhabitants, and they make uh, about 13, more than 13 million trips in a business day. But if we are talking about Bogota region, uh, we have more than uh, 10 million inhabitants, and they make about 16 million trips in a business day. So that's why that's the reason because uh, we need to reduce the use of cars in our city. Next, please. Since September 2020, uh, Bogota established an exception for the restriction of circulation of motor vehicles. For vehicles with three or more users, uh, including the driver, uh, people can log on on a website where they can access to one week permission of circulation with no restriction. So this system works with plain numbers and citizens can renew the permission very uh, every time they need. So because of that, more than 3,000 vehicles uh, have been registered uh, every week to access uh, for the exception. According to the information that we have uh, on the website, every uh, vehicle register makes six round trips, in which this means that about 175,000 round trips uh, have been reduced with high occupancy of, it means three people uh, or, or more by car. So I think we are going, we are doing a very well job in this uh, topic. Next, please. 
So during the pandemic, about 220,000 vehicles have been registered. Uh, it means that uh, people are reacting very well to the measure that already, we already have. Next, please. Bogota has set a goal. Uh, we already have a car occupation of the city from 1.5 person per vehicle, but uh, our goal is to get uh, more than two car occupants per vehicle. So that's the reason because the city seeks reduce traffic congestion, uh, reduce emissions, reduce, uh, reduce accidents, but also improve travel time. Next, please. From July 2021, it means, it means next month, we'll be working on improving the way of the people registered for this exception. So car owners can download one app to access one week circulation permission for high occupation vehicles. So we are uh, trying to make a eco-conscious car use in our city uh, uh, and to, in order to reduce the traffic congestion, as I was saying before, and trying to convince no people to get the second car. So that's very important. And, and also, it's a measure that you can combine with all the BRT systems that we already have in our city. Next, please. And talking about keeping cycling, uh, we have many things to say here. Uh, the public policy for bicycle is supported in five axes. Uh, road safety, personal safety, more, more uh, bikes for all, more and better bike trips in terms of uh, building more infrastructure uh, for bike users. Uh, we already have about 580 kilometers of bike paths but we would like to, buy, to build about 280 kilometers more in this period of the government. We want to increase in 50% uh, the, the bike trips, the bike trips, sorry, uh, set a goal of uh, 1 million and 320,000 trips uh, in a business day. Also, we need to reduce uh, in 10% of PM10 and 10% of PM2.5 in order to reduce the emissions. Uh, we also are planning to build uh, or to get a share bike system uh, with more than uh, 2,000 bikes. And and these 2,000 bikes will be available for make about 12,000 trips every day. We have set a goal to have more than 5,000 parking spots for bikes. And as you know, this will make using the bike more attractive, uh, more safe, safer and easier for citizens. Micro mobility uh, has gained ground in Bogota model share. Uh, given the lower impact on the environment and traffic, uh, with a good relationship, uh, relationship between benefits and cost. That is uh, what we have prepared for today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juan Esteban. Very interesting to see how Bogota has positioned ride sharing and carpooling at the center of demand management during pandemic times. But most interesting to see how micro mobility is paving its way to become the most sustainable mobility alternative for the city. So thank you very much for your intervention. And now let me introduce to uh, Mrs. Mila Bruno, 
She is the executive director from the LACTI European Green Capital 2021 project. Welcome, Mrs. Bruno. Thank you so much. I had to change my background because there's a very rare occasion that I have actually traveled today to Poland to be in a panel tomorrow, and I'm in a hotel room, which is probably something that none of us has experienced for a while. Uh, good afternoon to everybody, uh, and greetings from Lahti, the European Green Capital. Uh, I am the executive director for, the, for this uh, year, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what is this year about, and then I'll tell you more about the urban mobility plans here in Lahti. Next slide, please. please. City of Lahti is a lot uh, different than from Bogota, let's say that. City of Lahti is a, a city of 120,000 inhabitants, and we have about 200,000 urban region population around us. We have a very central logistics situation because we are only one hour from the capital of Helsinki. We are, we are a very modern industrial city and a home of the LUT University since 2019, the youngest university city in Lahti. We are a typical European mid-sized city. So even though we're a smaller city, we represent a larger part of the population than, let's say, the, the capitals of different nations. Next slide. So at that point, saying we are the smallest and the northernmost European green capital so far. Next slide. So European Commission has this competition every year where uh, uh, cities in Europe, over 100,000 people can apply for to get recognition for their environmental work. Lahti has uh, uh, applied for this competition three times, and we each time got to the final stage because of the ac ac accomplishments that we have done in the Lahti region over the past decades. Next slide, please. There is a few slides for you to show what we have done so far. Today, in 2021, when we are acting as the green, uh, greenest city in Europe, as the European green capital, we have already cut our CO2 emissions by 70%, 7 zero, which means that we have, uh, we have, we are very close to being carbon neutral and already have a very solid plan how to be carbon neutral by 2025. 10 years ahead of the schedule for Finland, and also 25 years ahead of the schedule for the, for the EU. The biggest change in this has been the fact that we have uh, stopped using coal in 2019, and today all of our district heating production is done CO2 emission free. So, which means that we don't produce any CO2 emissions from our energy sector. Another important point is that already from the 90s, we have started to util utilize our municipal waste, and today only 1% of our waste goes to landfill. 99% of our waste is utilized either for energy or for uh, materials. Next slide, please. The next step that we need to take to become carbon neutral is to make sure that our sustainable urban mobility plan for 2030 takes place. Our plan is that by 2030, more than half of our mobility is done sustainably, is done more sustainably than today, which means that we need to make sure that we have access to public transportation. We have public transportation that is using uh, electricity as their uh, energy or, or other like biofuels. Also, we need to make sure that we have bike paths. We need to make sure that we have people, uh, people have access to good uh, walking paths and also make sure that uh, still people who are using their private cars, which is of course something that they are allowed to, that, that they have access to uh, sustainable ways of using their own cars. And that comes to the electrification of our uh, traffic, for instance. And another thing that we need to concentrate is our uh, con uh, construction. How do we make sure that our construction uh, is going to be more sustainable in the future when we're building new buildings, when we're tearing down new buildings, when we're zoning, zoning uh, for buildings? Next, please. So the urban mobility solutions that we have now set for the next 10 years include four main themes. Next, please. Those are sustainably growing Lahti, Lahti city center, 
Lahti of Services and Lahti for Living. Next, please. Lahti wants to be a growing city. We need to make sure that the city still grows and uh, uh, stays vital, but we need to do that sustainably. So we need to make sure that the cycling infrastructure is, uh, is good for the cyclist. We need to make sure that we have good maintenance for the bike paths because we have many months of snow every year. So we have different, uh, different uh, uh, conditions, of course, compared to, let's say, southern cities. We need to make sure that we implement the cycling uh, uh, plans for the city employers and also to the schools and city personnel. And we also have to communicate to sustainability matters more efficiently. And it's also very important that the bicycles have an easy way to maintain maintenance their bikes. Next, please. Next slides, please. S of course, we need to also make sure that the citizens of Lahti will get their services uh, provided to them very efficiently. We need to make sure that the public transportation uh, is serving the actual needs of our residents when it comes to travel times and also uh, to accessibility in the fringe areas of the city, not just the city centre. We need to monitor, we need to collect data all the time to make sure that we can, we can be uh, flexible when it comes to our public tr transportation uh, models. We also make sure, we need to make sure that we have alternative fuels uh, used also in public transportation. And in about two weeks, we will start our uh, fleet of 17 e-buses uh, in Lahti, which is compared to the city size, the biggest e-bus fleet in Finland. So we're very proud of that. Uh, that transformation that we're doing just next month. And also we are implementing our city bike system uh, this year, and uh, which means that we're going to be having uh, bikes that, and e-bikes especially, that uh, anybody in the city or visit in the city can share. Next, please. We also need to make sure that uh, the, the action plans that we're doing for our mobility plan also support our road safety and education work with traffic education. Uh, and we need to make sure that the future generations uh, learn how to be also uh, responsible in, in, in traffic and make sure that uh, it, it serves its purpose. Next, please. CityCap is a project that we experimented with a personal carbon trading scheme, scheme for mobility. This was a project that was funded by the EU, and it had a, it also included a smart cycling path that we implemented that this year. This uh, this uh, uh, project has come to its pilot has come to an end, so all the results are now sh shareable. But in in short, I can tell you that we had 2,500 users that create uh, wanted to create an ID to this carb personal carbon trading scheme. We had weekly users of th up to 350 users. 70% of these people who used it, they felt that this was a fair way to reduce emissions in a society. And also uh, they felt that uh, it was fair how they were monitored using this pilot. And 36% of our, our uh, people who were part of this pilot reduced their mobility em emissions during this pilot period. Next, please. And last, uh, we are implementing a green electrification of mobility ecos ecosystem in the, in, the, in the area at the moment during our green capital year, which means that together with the Finnish government and our city, we have agreed to develop a cluster of e-mobility technologies and productions in Lahti. We call it the GEM, which is the green electrification of mobility ecosystem, where we are uh, getting together with the top level researchers from the universities, we get uh, facilities available for, from different stakeholders. We have already 30 companies that have assigned for it. And also we are using the Green Capital Project as a, as a leverage for it. Next, please. This is uh, my uh, 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 contact information that I'm hoping that the, the organizers will share with you. So feel free to get in contact with me if you want to know more about the sustainable actions that the city of Lahti is taking. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Mrs. Bruno. Very interesting to see how LACTI is at the center of the innovative solutions to reduce emissions and become carbon neutral and how urban mobility solution has contributed to this goal. Thank you very much. And finally, to close this wonderful set of good practices, I'd like to introduce you to Antonio Godoy. He's Secretary of Mobility and Public Space of the City of Morelia. Welcome to the TCC Week, Mr. Godoy. Bienvenido. Thank you. Hola. I hope uh, my connection is working well. Yes. Hi there. We can hear you. Uh, okay. So, uh, can we start with the presentation, please? I think something is, uh, we have a technical problem. Okay, yeah. So, I would like to thank the Agency of Cooperation of Germany, the uh, Agency of G uh, HIS, so, uh, for the invitation to participate in this uh, workshop. Our presentation will, uh, uh, go by the mobility data application for travel experience improvement. Next slide, please. So the the um, uh, context of us is like uh, the city of Morelia. Uh, we didn't have before uh, this administration an institution that uh, promote the uh, mobility and the walking or cycling in the city. So we had this uh, main goal to generate inclusion and equ equity conditions in the mobility of the and use of public space in Morelia. Next, please. Um, we have to uh, work all the way to, to even uh, do some previous work to um, make this technical standard of strict design who allowed, uh, maybe, I mean, that allowed us to uh, design streets for pedestrian and cycling and uh, promoting the uh, transport in the city. Next. So Morelia, we have a population of almost uh, 900,000 uh, uh, population. It's the capital city of the state of Michoacán in Mexico. So we are, uh, the city was, uh, uh, rise in the 16th century. So we have also a city center that is part of the World Heritage uh, Patrimony declared by the UNESCO. Next, please. So how do we move? Uh, we are like a walking uh, city. We have a lot of walking uh, travel in, in Morelia. 26% of the population walks, 35% uh, uh, use transit. Uh, also, we have 35% of the population that uses a particular automobile, and we have 2.5% uh, of, um, of uh, people that use bikes. Okay, so next please. So what did we did? Uh, we use uh, digital tools, tools with uh, students in 2017 with uh, social um, NGOs. So we decide to plan the city, the cycling network in the city. Next, please. So we uh, did a collaborative, a collaborative uh, mapping of cycling routes. Almost two uh, hundred uh, students participate on it, and so. We, uh, from there, we designed the uh, part of the cycling routes in the city. Next. This is the result of the cycling network. Uh, we have different uh, uh, cycl uh, cycling routes. We have uh, um, shred uh, priority uh, lanes. We have bike lanes and we have uh, segregated uh, uh, bike, bike lanes. Next. Uh, our transit, uh, we have almost uh, uh, a lot, uh, six, uh, 60,000 uh, boarding uh, people in the rush hour, and we have a total uh, estimated of almost 3,000 units in the city. 
The problem is that 69% uh, of that uh, of that transit corresponds of, of for vans, 10% for buses, and 21% for microbuses. We have in, in in the different routes. We have the urban routes, 72 routes in Morelia. Next. We have uh, 40 uh, routes of suburb suburban routes functioning in Morelia. And foreign routes, uh, almost uh, 40, uh, 40 routes in the, uh, that comes all the way to the city. So that makes uh, a lot of uh, uh, problems for our planification. One of the problems we have in, the Morel in Morelia is that transit, uh, it's a um, rule and uh, organized by the state, not the municipality. So uh, us as a um, uh, um, recent um, institution, we have to create a diagnosis that uh, need to improve the infrastructure and also the travel experience for uh, the transit riders in the city. Next. So we start using some of the tools that uh, we have for, for data um, um, generation. Next. So the conclusion is that 53% of the population is satisfied with the service. 19% uh, of the people uh, get into the transit in the official stops. So that's what that's one of the problems, main problems of transit. And uh, we don't have like uh, any kind of information uh, for boarding or the kind of routes we have in the city. So there is a lot of uh, pro uh, problems here for the transit. Next. We uh, did a, a routeathon that it's a mapping exercise using the tool map map. So we got the 40 suburban routes. Next. Uh, the exercise result that um, uh, we have a lot of, uh, now we have data for those 40 routes of rise and fall of the transport, the time and length for each route. However, the important uh, is that we need to generate more data. As you can see, we only recollect the information for 40% of the transit in the city. Next. So now we are using a Movi data, Movi data tool that it will allow us to identify uh, and generate more information about transit. So this is a special collaboration with uh, the agency and the uh, city of Yucatan, uh, of Merida, Yucatan. Next. Now, uh, as the municipality, we are able to introduce more public, as, uh, public stops uh, to make more comfortable and, produce, and promote a service for the community. Next. We are also uh, making this uh, image for the transit to make uh, different locations of the important routes of the transport in this, uh, of the transit in the city. Next. And well, this is our contact. I hope uh, uh, the technical problems didn't uh, uh, impact in the presentation. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Godoy, for your presentation. It's really interesting to see how City of Morelia has implemented that application for improving travel experiences. I am also impressed and pleased to see that cycling is at the center of promotion for sustainable mobility. And well, thank you very much to our special guest for having joined us in this first block, first block of presentation. It really tells us a picture of the innovation and tools, and tools, but also the measures to overcome congestion in urban areas. And by overcoming congestion, cities surely are fighting climate change, which is at the center of this Transport Week. Thank you very much. Well, Andre, what do you think about all these impressive, impressive experiences our guest just presented? I'm handing over to you in the studio in Berlin for the next block. Thank you very much, Caroline. That's super exciting, super interesting, and I really enjoyed the presentations. Now, after we've seen what the cities have done 
and what the cities have uh, planned for their cities, we are turning on the other side, on the private sector side. Now we talk to the private sector um, representatives how they are addressing the climate change and how, what are their solutions to the cities to do that. Our first speaker today is Paula Rauf. Paula worked in the mobility field for over a decade, both in Germany and abroad. She gained experience in behavior change interventions, a car-sharing social enterprise, and active travel projects. Subsequently, she joined public transport consultancy here in Berlin, covering digital transformation topics. Paula leads business development at Fairtick in Germany with the vision of making public transport more attractive to use. Please welcome Paula. Thanks a lot, Andre. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, um, and it's amazing to follow on Mr. Godoy. Um, the experience in Morelia, especially his public transport um, angles, I think um, maybe we can we can help. Maybe there is some uh, potential future collaboration. Anyway, I'm presenting Fertig. Uh, we are a Swiss public transport app, and we've simplified over 27 million journeys. In fact, I think today we will hit 28 million. Thank you for the opportunity. Next slide. So we always talk about public transport as the backbone of uh, urban sustainable mobility. Um, certainly in Europe, this is a case to pre um, attract those who are driving to use public transport. And as we've heard from the other cities, this is uh, a topic globally. But if we want to attract people to use public transport, why on earth do we make it so complicated? It's you need a degree in order to get a ticket or you need the correct change to pay at the driver. And we thought this can't go on. So you could say, next slide, you could say maybe you should just build an app. So here we see two examples of five or six steps to get to your ticket in the app. And we think digitization should make it even easier to get to your ticket, so we developed Fairtick. So if you just click one more, exactly. Um, Fairtick is a check-in, check-out ticketing app using GPS. And all the end user needs to do is swipe to the right to get a valid ticket. You don't need to know about tariffs. You don't need to know about which zone you're traveling in. All you need to do is swipe to the right and we take the complexity away from the user and ensure um, they have a valid ticket. Next slide, please. So this is how it starts. Actually, if you could go to the next one, I don't know if you have the, uh, you, um, anyway. Um, so once you've checked in, uh, you can show a barcode that can be controlled by electronic means or even visual control. And at the end of the journey, you check out or um, the smart stop feature ends your journey and the user sees the exact trip they took and the price it cost. So what we managed to implement and what's in daily use um, across the whole of Switzerland and many regions in Germany and Austria is simplicity for the end user. Swiping to the right, swiping to the left, anyone can do that. But also um, a real advantage of this software-based solution is low costs for the operators. There's no need for hardware. There's no need for complex real-time data that you may need. We can install Fairtick in your region within a few weeks. All we need is the planning data for public transport. So the lines and routes that you have and you're good to go. Okay, next slide. The great thing is we get uh, great anecdotal feedback. Um, for example, one user wrote to us, maybe he, ha he had a few too many. The best possible public transport app out there at the moment, even a monkey after three gin and tonics could use it. But it's not just anecdotal feedback, it's also uh, real figures. So if you go to the next slide, we've seen massive uh, usage growth over the past five years even last year with the pandemic, which was incredibly challenging for public transport, our sales channel has seen growth in the regions where we were. 
Um, and yeah, without public transport, I guess we would have projected um, an even steeper curve. And I think already now we have achieved more than uh, more trips than in the last year. Next slide. We, have, we take pride in not just providing a simple ticketing solution, but almost with the byproduct of the data that is generated by using the app, we help innovate public transport. So if you go to the next slide, you can see how our technology can be used to innovate completely new tariff versions. So rather than having zones or rings um, as are present in many places, we can make distance-based tariffs. So why should users pay for weird uh, zones that someone came up with at some point when actually they just want to travel from A to B and they're happy to pay a fair distance, priced, uh, distance price? So next slide. Um, the data we generate through the ticketing sales um, can be used for planning purposes. So you see actual interchanges where people interchanged and um, the demand on the different lines. Next slide. But also we are happy to bring in new partnerships into the public transport world. So who would have thought that an OEM subsidizes public transport? They do so by giving all of their customers who buy an electric vehicle in Switzerland, Mercedes um, offers all these customers a 40 franc voucher every month for 12 months. Therefore subsidizing public transport close to 500 francs um, in a year. And uh, these are the kind of partnerships that we need to take public transport forward. Next slide, please. So this is where we operate today. I know it's still very European centric, but we do have a colleague in North America and one in, or two in Asia actually. And uh, we look forward to growing this startup, which initially started in Switzerland five years ago and has grown over into the Dach region, so Austria and Germany, now to France, uh, Belgium and the UK. We hope that this is a global solution, that it's an idea that can help simplify public transport in many other regions so that many people can join in our vision, which is the next slide, of making sustainable mobility, everyday mobility, really simple for everyone and everywhere. Thank you. Looking forward to questions and the discussion later. Paula, thank you so much. Finally, someone who thinks about the end user. Someone please call the German railways. <laughs> That's so refreshing <laughs> to see. Um, now we come to our next presentation, Philippe. Philippe and I, we have a long history of working on problems, sometimes solutions in transport sector. And um, Philip is joining us from the sunny uh, Los Angeles, what you can't see in the background, but it's, uh, I hope it's sunny. And um, it is. so I'm super excited to introduce Philip and uh, his new venture, the Urban Radar, um, ranging from overseeing e-scooters operators to repurposing curbside space for urban freight. Urban Radar's technology enables new mobility planning for cities. So everyone, please welcome Philip. Thank you, Andres, and <clears throat> I'm so happy to be here and um, with um, with all of you. Um, it's really good to uh, um, to see all these um, solutions, which are very inspiring. Um, so let's go into the first slide. So um, when I was thinking, um, basically, when Andre contacted me for this uh, panel, I was thinking about, okay, how <clears throat> how can I take a new, in a way, a new angle uh, into um, thinking of uh, improving um, trans, uh, transport demand modeling and um, uh, in the city through public transportation. And I related it to a piece of work we increasingly do for cities, uh, which is basically curb management, as opposed to look at um, the things that move in the city. We look at the, the fixed assets, which is curb management. So it's all about how can we improve uh, or uh, yeah, how can we improve curb management to facilitate traffic in the city, 
minimize obstructions and therefore promote um, public transportation uh, efficiency. So let's go to the next slide and the next one. So basically, an increasing number of cities talk to us about curb management to restructure transit patterns. Cities look at how can we reduce congestion, improve our quality, improve safety. And they need to understand patterns of multiple layers of transportation to be able to plan accordingly, which is where the technology comes into play because it's giving access to new ways of planning and managing the city. And basic challenge is how can they access their own data? Uh, and then obviously, how can cities or transportation planners access private sector data to build this overarching view? And at the same time, what we see is the goals of um, public transportation, new mobility, but also logistics is about how can we be efficient? Um, like Andre uh, mentioned um, just before, uh, it's end user and satisfaction, whoever they are, and obviously safety. Um, and what everybody uh, who, who moves in the city needs is a reliable access to curb um, to improve efficiency, uh, be able to be fast, efficient, and obviously as well access to updated regulation because there's a lot of things going on in cities that confuses end users when they move. But every city is different. We all know it. So there are therefore multiple shades of curbs. Um, let's go to the next slide. So uh, briefly, Urban Radar. So I'm Philippe Papin, CEO of Urban Radar. Um, what we do is provide provide a tech solution um, to help cities, transportation planner, uh, um, essentially plan better <laughs> um, with new uh, data and with the data that's now available. Um, so we, what we do is we aggregate all sorts of uh, information to then help um, <clears throat> visualize a city, uh, the multiple patterns in the city. Then we obviously provide analytics to manage the city based on the use cases. And ultimately, we can run machine learning algorithm for, um, for prediction and uh, um, forward-looking planning. Let's go to the next one. Um, <clears throat> And the key thing we bring is understand before taking action. So we understand the patterns, we understand the usage, we can then map, retrace the traffic patterns, and then we can measure the impact on uh, we can measure the impact on the key goals of the city: congestion, climate, air quality. And then we can act one use case at a time. We, we're not trying to tackle everything at once. Let's go to the next slide, and let's go to the next one. So. Um, let me sh uh, show you a few examples. So um, the city of Versailles in France, near uh, south of Paris, many of you must have gone to the um, chateaus, to the castle. Uh, basically, the problem is how can we reduce congestion so we can improve uh, public transportation efficiency? And as we looked at multiple angles, what we realized is actually it's logistics who impacts uh, public transit efficiency, uh, uh, buses efficiency, because essentially they park, they, uh, you know, they double park, that creates congestion and that blocks the whole, um, the whole city. So the best way to have impact was how we can minimize um, double parking. And what we did is we uh, essentially, we reviewed the parking with our technology. We correlated the parking offering with the delivery uh, uh, usage demand to analyze how can the city repurpose or review its curb management strategies, parking strategies, so that the city, so that the delivery um, trucks do not double park anymore, and therefore improving the traffic flow. And that has been uh, uh, extremely successful. Um, the city essentially updated its logistics parking uh, strategy, so its curb management strategy, because it was not taking into account the new usage of last mile deliveries, the increase of deliveries, and so on. And therefore, um, now the city um, uh, runs uh, more efficiently. And we measure it. Um, we measure it through a congestion index uh, from data we have uh, from partners such as. Uh, um, Google, Waze, and uh, this TomTom, -tom, this type of um, data sources. Um, but what we saw from a very practical angle is, as always, setting up clear objectives and be agile. Let's go to the next one, which is 
Um, similar uh, work we've been doing with the support of EIT, Urban Mobility and the um, European Union and uh, in Barcelona, where we essentially also the challenge was the same. Tackle logistics will help the city resolve uh, public transportation uh, and um, um, transportation of people efficiency. And so <clears throat> here, um, what we um, what 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 we saw because they have way more um, sources of data. Uh, what what we saw is um, we can easily. Um, um, update the curb management um, by uh, by using the data they have in place um, and they, they are using a solution called Aria Doom which is essentially um, a way to book parking for logistics companies. Um, let's go to the next slide because I'm running out of time. Um, the point here uh, was to say no curb is equal because every city is different, has different priorities, whether they're political or operational. Um, the challenges of the logistic companies when we want to act on this is also um, can be uh, can be different, so it needs to be taken into account. But what we see increasingly throughout Europe is, it, and it's fascinating, it's there's a convergence of public and private interest to collaborate, um, to share their data, to build together the city of the future, which was um, said in introduction. The, 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 the century of the of the city goes through public and private partnerships. And I will end here basically. So if you can go to the last slide up. So please feel free to contact me if you have any questions. Look forward to the panel and um, thank you everybody. Philippe, thank you very, very much. We've been hoping for one example, how uh, one innovative example, but you provided us several. And that's great. And I hope that our listeners made some notes and uh, I hope they come and uh, stay in touch with you. But we will have an interesting Q&A session at the end of it. So now let's move on to, uh, to Dennis. Our next speaker, we have Dennis Pass, who collaborated with Trophy Association, an international NGO. He will represent the organization, the current project around multimodal public transport he's working on. He joined Trophy only a couple of months ago and worked with Smart Cities Domain before. Thanks for being with us today, David. Thank you for having me and especially us on behalf of Trophy. Uh, we see this as a very big opportunity to share our vision with so many people from public transportation and such a wide reaching network. So yeah, we're very happy to be here. Thank you. Maybe we can go to the first slide. <clears throat> This is the second slide, but yes, uh, all right. Yeah, we are Trophy. We are an NGO that's acting worldwide on a worldwide scale, providing or trying to provide digital solutions for public for public transport, with the vision of um, making public transportation accessible for for all parts of the population, uh, as it improves quality of life drastically, which is pretty much also how it started three years ago with the question: How can we make informal transport more accessible? And what is informal transport? I'm pretty sure a lot of you guys or a lot of you know already what informal transport is. Um, yeah, so I'm going to keep it short on this one. It's just about not having official stops, no schedules, no documented bus lines, etc. And it always, it can be a blessing, but a curse at the same time for the citizens um, of, develop, of cities in developing countries. Next slide, please. Yeah, as I mentioned already, there's a lot of studies uh, that show the opportunities in this area uh, about public transport drastically improving the quality of life of the population in developing countries and developing and future metropole cities of developing countries or like bigger cities in developing countries. Next slide, please. We as Trophy have around 80 to 90 uh, community members and people acting all uh, in behalf of Trufi all over the world. Uh, we put a lot of focus on our um, local communities because they are a key to our success as Trufi, especially when we look at how we work uh, in those developing countries. Next slide, please. So what is Trufi? Uh, yeah, it's a non-profit uh, startup for informal public transport. Uh, started three years ago and 
yeah, the mission or vision is to improve public transport worldwide, worldwide through digitization, as I mentioned already. Next slide, please. Our main product uh, is the Trophy app. This is also our white label product, which was one of the first apps that got developed uh, with the city of Cochabamba in Bolivia. This is a multimodal journey planner uh, that enabled the city to uh, start mapping informal bus routes in the city. And this white label or Trophy app or Trophy core, as we call it as well, is the white uh, is being carried out into other developing countries. This was also the first um, open source journey planner that uh, worldwide that was accepted into the Apple Store. So we were very proud when we finalized this project. And yeah, next slide. But at Trophy, we're not uh, only about uh, providing an app for the cities, but more enabling the locals. As I mentioned, we don't. Um, we try to uh, go into the developing countries and start by community building and enabling the locals for them to make their needs of public transportation more visible to the governments or the bigger organizations in those uh, developing countries as well. Um, yeah, this is also our core approach because it connects and empowers the beneficiaries in the end of the um, of the app or the solution that we're providing and the services. Yeah, and here you can see some pictures. So we started with community building. We started mapping um, the routes that were not there. And then we applied all of the data that we collected regarding the routes into our Trophy core uh, white label app, I will say. And in the end, the city um, yeah, is able to better manage their traffic or public transport uh, traffic in the cities. Next slide, please. As part of our core services, of course, uh, it's Trophy app, which is our, I will say, also the app that is kind of represents our brand throughout, throughout the world. Um, and we, besides that, we also provide services like training of local teams, maintenance of bus routes, and data platforms for better public transport planning, as I mentioned already in the process of how we work in those developing countries to make public transport more accessible. Next slide, please. This is a, you can click two times more. So this is a world, uh, yeah, this is a map of where we are active all over the world. We usually always have a correspondent in each of those um, locations that supports us locally with connecting to the locals, to the governments and to the city officials so that we can carry in our vision into those cities and developing countries. Next slide, please. But this is not, uh, but we are not only acting in developing countries. Like in recent years, we also started seeing the need of such a multimodal or intermodal journey planner in, yeah, in countries like Germany as well, which is why we went to different hackathons like the ITS in 2020, where we try to make public transport also more accessible and attractive to people in large scale cities of Europe so that they, um, so that the incentive of using public transport and bikes, like in this example, more attractive than you going by car, for example. Next slide, please. And this is another hackathon that we won with uh, one implementation around trying to make public transport more accessible to uh, wheelchair users by um, collecting data from the Bahn, from the German transport, uh, or the biggest German transport organization on how their elevators work, if they're working, are they out of service, etc. And that way we wanted to also provide, as I mentioned in our vision earlier, public transport to be more accessible to all parts of the population, not only in developing countries, but also in countries like Germany and European countries that are probably a little bit more developed in that regard. Next slide. Um, the current project or the most current project that we're working on is the project Stadtnab in Herrenberg, which is a, a project that is um, yeah, based in Herrenberg and is around, uh, the web app was developed as part of the city's clean air initiative. So they were cho chosen as one of five pilot cities in Germany to su uh, support it by the Federal Ministry of Transport and uh, Digital Infrastructure. And 
the project was obviously around sustainability and improving the city's public transport uh, transportation offerings to lower traffic within the city of Herrenberg because it has uh, old parts in the city with like s small roads that are not accessible for cars. So they wanted to improve that and it's open source. Next slide. Yeah, this is just the start screen of the, the app, as you can see, next slide. You have a screen uh, shot of the current web app where you see that it's multimodal or intermodal, which means that the journey planner use, tries to use as many, not as many, it tries to suggest the optimal route depending on which mode you are traveling in. You can see some tiles at the top underneath, if you could stay one second, or yeah. Uh, yeah, you can see tiles that where you can choose from bike and ride or park and ride where you use your car and then afterwards try to uh, use the bus so that you don't have to drive into the city with uh, by car all the way. Next slide. And how we do support cities. So as I mentioned, we provided uh, or we provide a multimodal uh, journey planner already, which is key to reducing car traffic in cities because it makes more it makes it more attractive for people to use public transport if it's more interconnected um, yeah multimodalities in our genes as that's how the idea started pretty much uh, we have experience with working with city officials and the vision of a lot of cities actually that we talk to is what our mission mission looks like to provide public transport or make it more accessible to all parts of the population uh, yeah and we have a big yeah, open source multimodal public transport network and the Stadnavi app is also open source and will be rolled out or used as white label to be rolled out into other cities of Germany. Thank you very much and feel free to contact me or yeah, Christoph on the emails that you see on the screen. Thank you. Dennis, thank you very, very much. As a keen traveler and professional and transportation professional, of course, I am very familiar with informal transport. And for decades, it seems to be insurmountable. It's impossible to bring order into this chaos. And now there is a solution to it and uh, sounds like a good one. So great. Um, with this, I, um, I have the pleasure and uh, the honor to close this part of the session. So where, where we have three solutions from the private sector, um, it uh, has been an incredibly interesting journey and an incredibly interesting um, uh, solutions that can be used. So, um, and now, last but not least, uh, we, uh, we will speak to Professor Heinrichs, who will provide yet another view to, uh, to this round. Uh, Professor Heinrichs is uh, technical, is advises the KFW on technical aspects of design and implementation of urban mobility in Latin and Central America. He holds a master's degree in environmental planning and a doctorate in urban and regional planning. Aside from practical experience, Dirk has a track record in research and teaching. Before joining the KFW, he was head of the urban mobility department at the DLR Institute of Transport Research and is now Honorary Professor for Urban Mobility at Technical University in Berlin. Please welcome Dirk. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, um, Andre. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm honored by this uh, enormous um, introduction. So what I'm really doing uh, most of my work now is uh, working on transport related projects in Latin America in different countries. And the way I understand my um, input to this uh, session here is more of a reflection on uh, what we have heard so far and of course a perspective um, from um, a development bank's uh, perspective. And um, because of this I, I have decided sort of not to prepare a presentation but rather sort of um, um, come with some spontaneous observations on, on those two points. Um, let me start with the, with the first aspect that the, um, the session raises, the question, how can technology help in making transport more sustainable? And the way I would interpret this really extremely 
uh, encouraging examples that we have heard both from the public sector and also from the private uh, sector today is basically sort of they have two objectives and two things where digitalization can help us. First of all, it's the issue of data capture um, and data really can support a lot in terms of making the invisible visible. For example, transport supply, as we have seen in the example of Morelia, uh, also the presentation by Urban Radar and, 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 and some others as well, but also making explicit and visible demand, um, so mobility behavior, and uh, use this data, of course, for planning and for regulation. Yeah? Um, of course, aside from these examples, sort of that we have uh, that we have heard today, sort of there's always two examples that come to my mind, sort of that demonstrate how this has put uh, has been put already to to practice. One is uh, the, the the digital Matatu uh, project, sort of where, to my knowledge, first ever sort of a mapping of informal transport not only led to the adoption and endorsement of this map by the city authorities, but also to an analysis of possible expansions of the services to currently underserved area made visible by the drivers yeah, and the operators. And two is the city of uh, Sao Paulo who has set up a system for regulating its transit network cooperation. So those right Haley companies that have to share their data, that have to register and the city is regulating um, um, the services and it's also generating income based uh, on these kind of um, regulations and the agreements they have with the transit providers. The second objective uh, that I could make out from the presentation sort of that uh, the cities and also the applications developed by the private sector, by the businesses uh, um, are, are looking at is providing information um, 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 sort of to really make um, those options that we want to support more attractive to users. As for example, we have seen in the Fertic uh, presentation by Paula Rua, uh, but also the presentation uh, uh, on, on, on Bogota. Yeah. There's one thing sort of that I find very, very important here is sort of to, to, to look when we, when we see and when we uh, try and find out how we can make sort of the use of a certain transport mode more attractive for users is of course to, 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 to sort of see what are sort of further on effects uh, um, normally sort of um, defined as rebound effects um, um, sort of of this kind of change in behavior. So that is a little bit kind of the, the user impact uh, of the technology that is being implemented. And let me just share one example um, that came to my mind from, from the US where studies show that the, the ride hailing um, services of these transit network corporations that have been made possible largely of course to the to the advent of uh, of, of, of mobile applications sort of um, among the many uh, positive effects that sort of this has for users um, uh, there are also indications sort of that in some instances sort of um, users have shifted from public transport and also users reported that they made trips that they wouldn't have done um, uh, if that service would not have been available so understanding the effects on user choices i find is very very uh, important so let me then use my last two minutes uh, of the of the input to sort of what this now means for for a development bank like the KFW. Uh, of course, KFW is clearly committed to support the achievement of the sustainable development goals and the mobility sector. Um, if we would run through the, the different uh, goals, is connected to a whole range of SDG access, health and safety, energy efficiency, and of course, mitigation of, uh, of emissions. Um, and KFW is financing interventions to achieve these objectives. Um, and it does so to some extent, of course, uh, um, on behalf of the German Ministry for, for Cooperation. And what guides us there uh, in our projects is the strategy that the BNZ has with regards to digitalization, uh, which has basically five pillars, leveraging digitalization for employment, promoting local innovation, promoting equal uh, opportunities in education, uh, good governance, and 
providing data for development. And we have started a practice of what we call digital by default, which means that whenever we finance and implement uh, a project, the feasibility analysis contains a specific item um, uh, in the terms of reference that sort of takes specific recognition to explore the potential of how digital technologies can improve outcome and output of investment. And with this, uh, uh, I can say sort of that the, the number of projects in the transport sector that, uh, that for example, I'm involved in with, um, with sort of which, which, which include digitalization um, aspects has uh, increased quite tremendously in the very recent time. Um, um, I cannot go into sort of uh, the details uh, looking at the time, um, um, but to close my, my input sort of based on that experience in working on these projects, um, um, sort of there are some lessons, uh, some personal observations that I have with regards um, to digitalization in, in, in projects. First of all, uh, my experience is that digitalization is really a very, very fascinating potential addition to the work we do and the projects we finance. That means that we do not stop financing infrastructure, hard infrastructure, in, let's say public transport, mass transit systems or cycling infrastructure, but digitalization helps to make the infrastructure and its management, like has been reported on the curb uh, uh, example in the previous or one of the previous presentations helps to make this infrastructure more intelligent. Secondly, and connecting to the presentation by, by Paula Ruoff uh, uh, on Fertig, uh, digitalization is much more a social project. It, it is important to consider the user needs uh, and one has to work on understanding habits and routines and how they can be affected. Uh, also by people who are non-digital natives. Um, thirdly, expanding governance capacity is very, very important because digitalization adds a completely new topic to the management of the public sector, like organizational changes, data management tools, building hard and soft data infrastructure, building the interpretative competences. So which means sort of that uh, there's a lot of work connected um, um, uh, in order to be able to sort of reap also the benefits of um, digitalization. And here I want to end and uh, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to contribute to this session. No, well, we have to thank Dirk. Um, thank you so much for your insights. Uh, that of course, are based on various facets of your experience, be it from banking, but also research and development and, and, um, uh, and the various projects you've already done. So this is obviously um, very important for, 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 for us and for our listeners. Um, herewith, then, I conclude the, uh, the presentation part of the, uh, or the speaking part of the, of, the, of the session. And now we come to the uh, questions and answers where, where the, um, the viewers of the, of the Transport Week have posed questions in, in, a, in the chat and they've been collected and they've been uh, um, digested and now we're going to ask these questions and I'm very much looking forward to, to Miriam to join me again in, um, at the podium. And um, I would say we do it again like, uh, like the presentations. We start with uh, Carolina managing the uh, or the, the posing the, uh, the questions from the cities, and, and I will moderate and ask the questions from, uh, for the public sector, uh, for the private sector, excuse me. Um, Carolina, up to you. Thank you very much, Andre. Thank you very much for uh, all the presentations that we have had today. Very interesting, all the topics on all the experiences from the cities and how uh, the organizations are also thinking about providing digital solutions for managing the traffic in cities. So we have uh, questions for our um, special guests in the cities. So I would like to start with Bogota. There's two questions for Bogota. Uh, the first one um, is what were the major challenges for promoting more active mobility in Bogota? And how did the city tackle these challenges? So please, Juan Esteban, if you can provide us a perspective or an answer for this special question, please ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Carolina. Uh, yeah, 
Uh, there were three main challenges for bicycles uh, policy uh, since the 90s. Uh, Bogota administration has invested in a net of more than 590 kilometers. And during the pandemic, uh, we added another 80 kilometers for temporary lanes to reduce the pressure on the public transport system due to the, to the pandemic. Uh, the other topic is that uh, the inclusion of bicycles and micro mobility in the city's development plans and the urban design documents have been tackled by making studies and the adoption of the National Bicycle Infrastructure Design Guide. That's been very important um, in order to uh, tackle these challenges. And also multimodal integration uses and lack of bicycle parking spots. Uh, as I've shown you in the presentation, uh, the city is working uh, in different plans. So one of these is uh, built more than 5,000 5, parking spot bikes on the public space. And also we are planning to uh, implement uh, a bike share system with more than 2,000 bikes and 152 stations. Uh, and this uh, uh, parking uh, spot bikes uh, will be close to the BRT system and the future metro line system. And all of this is joined by promotion of micro mobility modes by public space, uh, use permission for mobility as, is, as a service, enterprises. So that's the, the first answer, uh, Carolina. Thank you very much, uh, Juan Esteban. Uh, it's really impressive what Bogota has done uh, in the last year in terms of micromobility and in terms of promoting active mobility uh, in the face of the pandemic. I have a second question, which is adverse also to Bogota and LACTI. So I would ask uh, first uh, Juan Esteban to answer that and then Mrs. Bruno. Uh, the question is, what policies did you implement at the city level and how were they accepted by the public? Uh, I'm sorry, Carol, can you, can you tell me again, please? Question? What, policies, what policies did you implement at the city level and how were they accepted by the public? Okay. You mean in terms of bicycles or in the right sharing? The in terms Sorry? of bicycles, in terms of the demand management program that you just told us about uh, ride sharing and carpooling. So how they were accepted by the general public in, in, in Bogota? Well, as, as, as I show you the results that we have more than 220,000 vehicles uh, that have had access to the circulation restriction exception. So we conclude that uh, people are reacting very well to the measure. So uh, what are we going to implement uh, in the uh, up to July to 2021, I mean next month, so uh, that we are going to have uh, a easier and faster access to get the permission so that we are sure that people uh, is going to get uh, more and more uh, uh, ways to to have the a very uh, the the one week permission. So so we we think that we are going to have more than two hundred twenty thousand vehicles uh, uh, to get this uh, option. So the, the measure uh, is going to be accepted by the citizens very well. I'm pretty sure of that, Juan Esteban. Thank you very much. And uh, please, uh, Mrs. Bruno, is the same question. What policies did you implement at the city level and how were they accepted by the general public in the city of Lahti? I don't think we can hear you. 
I, we can hear you, Mrs. Bruno. Maybe you have uh, to unmute your microphone. Can you hear me now? Okay, great, thank you. I'm sorry about that. Uh, as being one of the decision makers in the city, I'm also a politician in the city, so this is a very good question to ask. And one of the latest policies that we actually um, passed in the city council uh, this spring was the Sustainable Urban Mobility Plan for 2030 that I also briefly mentioned in my presentation. It is not a very easy decision to make because we are uh, um, uh, we are now getting to the area where we're telling people sort of how to move from from point A to to point B. What kinds of um, what kinds of urban plans and zoning issues we are facing in order to make sure that our sort of sustainable mobility increases in the future. This is actually a very um, difficult question to the citizens. And of course, the politicians in the city, in the city council represent the, the people of the city. So uh, it was a very tough question and it rose a lot of critique. So I have to, I want to bring this also to the conversation that it's not always very easy to do these policies. So you have to be very smart when you're making these policy, policies for the city where you actually at the same time, making sure like the city center being accessible for everybody, whether they use the public transportation, whether they use their own car, whether they use a bike or whether they share a car or whether they share a city bike, that you you need to listen to the citizens as much as you can in every phase of the planning session. And this is something that we, I think that we're very good at in city of Lahti, but of course we can always be better. And this is something that is also one of the main themes for Green Capital 2021 year is the citizen participation. How do we make sure that the citizens feel like they are part of the planning process of these uh, important issues that also affect their everyday life? Getting to work, getting to the doctor's office, getting to school, getting to the kindergarten, dropping off your kids to the kindergarten while you're going to work. So we need to make sure that when we're implementing uh, urban mobility plans for, for sustainable uh, solutions for the future, that you understand the everyday lives and needs of citizens, business owners, schools, etc. So it's, it's very important that you listen to the citizens and are also open to the critique. But I would say that, uh, Two thirds of our city council were for it and one third were against it. So that's a big number as well. And that means that for the next 10 years, when we imp implement this, this, uh, this sustainable urban, urban mobility plan for the city, we still need to re remember that in every phase that we're implementing the plan, we listen to the different stakeholders that are involved in our city. So citizen participation is very important. Thank you very much, Mrs. Bruno. And if policies are to be successful and accepted by citizens, participation is key in this matter. I have this last question for the city of Morelia for Mr. Godoy. Uh, it says, has the city gone for an extra land acquisition for accommodating additional infrastructure such as bike lanes or public transport? Uh, could you please repeat the first part of the question, please? Is the city of Morelia gone for an extra land acquisition for accommodating additional infrastructure such as bike lanes or public transport? Um, land acquisition. Mm -hmm. uh, well, not necessarily. We are just uh, doing... Um, the planification on the on the on the public use for the uh, roads and and shared space. So, uh, if I did understand the question, uh, we don't uh, are in this uh, stage of um, getting land. If that and just we are making the planification around the different. Uh, um, existing um, 
uh, road, roads on the city. Is that the question? Yes, thank you very much to our participants, uh, to our city representatives, and then I hand over to you, Andre. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, <laughs> thank you, I, I thought I was talking. Um, right, so let's move to the next question. Uh, so there's a great question to Fatigue Pola. Um, it's in French and uh, uh, from Yasmin Abdelaziz, but we translated it into English. How can city administration <laughs> introduce such system as presented by, uh, by FETIC in municipalities where transport is poorly formalized? So uh, the advantage of our system is that we don't uh, need a lot of infrastructure or data um, that you need to prepare. So it, as long as you have the timetable data, in even if it's different files from different operators, um, we should be able to, to implement this and then launch the solution with you. So our normal model is to work with public transport operators or the tariff communities, so the municipalities who organize public transport, um, and look at what data they have to enable the implementation. Thank you very much. Um, the next question goes to Philippe Urban Radar. It's from Marcial Echenike in Cambridge. And the question is, it seems that the cities have started to explore the use of drones to reduce congestion for deliverers. What are your thoughts on this? So, <clears throat> um, I think there's, there will be a lot of regulatory um, um, issues to deal with. So yeah, we hear a lot about um, drones, pilots for, for drones and so on. But right now, um, when we speak to um, to cities or to transportation planners, um, we, we don't necessarily talk about that. We talk really about what's happening on the ground, um, uh, how can they deal with a congestion issue for logistic or, or transportation. Um, but indeed, um, air mobility is becoming a hot topic. Um, but I, I would say I don't have any any practical thoughts about it, except that, yes, indeed, it's a hot topic, but I'm not sure about the regulation so far. But from a commercial point of view, of course, Urban Radar can integrate the, the drone data. Thank you, Philippe. Um, so uh, let's move to the next question. Dennis, Trufi Association. The question is from Ronja Kwasniok. How do you deal with data protection? Can you ensure the protection of sensitive data? Uh, so we don't even collect data. So the only data that we collect for the city of Herrenberg, for example, is um, the uh, GPS, GPS data that they provide when they use one of the features in the app. But besides that, uh, yeah, the policy or one of the policies that the city of Herrenberg gave us beforehand was that the focus should always be on open source and not collecting data of the user. So yeah technically i'm not 100 percent sure how it is implemented as i've been part of the truth organization for not too long yet but uh yeah you can feel free to contact us after this workshop or like session and we can discuss more about it if you want that's a great offer thank you very much dennis and um, i'm sure our our viewers we uh, um, will do that um, so let me move to, to the last question to Professor Heinrich. Uh, the question is from Anne Margaret Bolmer. Great to see that digital transportation of urban mobility also becomes a field of interest for financial development cooperation. Are there any projects which are currently run by KFW in this field? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for the question, because that gives me the opportunity to expand uh, sort of my talk a little bit on, on these examples that I, I omitted earlier on. I give you two examples, again, from my, uh, uh, my own personal uh, involvement, um, um, or maybe I give you three examples. One is an example from Mexico, where we are 
um, implementing a project on uh, on vehicle fleet renewal of commercial um, operators, uh, bus operators, bus owners, taxis, and um, and that uh, a project tries to improve uh, the standards of, of technology used for these buses um, as much as possible, sort of migrating to full battery electric mobility. And one of the conditions that we have in that project is that uh, um, operators or, or, or owners benefiting from uh, from sort of concessional loan have to sort of trade in their old vehicle. So that old vehicle, um, which in Mexico is not Normally, a very polluting old one um, sort of is then properly uh, uh, recycled and dismantled. And for this, they receive kind of a subsidy uh, uh, as a bonus, if, if you wish. And we um, are developing a fully digital uh, system, sort of that handles the entire form of communication, the processing of the data, because there's quite a number of entities involved, uh, including tracking of the vehicle to, to sort of really have a proof that at the end that all vehicle is is literally sort of uh, arriving at the, at the scrapping. Um, uh, ground and is then also um, uh, destroyed. And this is primarily, of course, to make the handling of everything sort of transparent and efficient, but also sort of to sort of uh, see sort of that there's no circumvention of this requirement to, to really sort of, um, uh, let's put it a little bit colloquial, sort of um, bring that old vehicle to, to, to its end and not having it run somewhere else. Um, the second project that we are currently sort of about to commission is a study in, um, using uh, uh, data uh, uh, sort of collection methodology to basically give, give us a uh, uh, first-hand information on the supply and the mobility demand in the city of Chiclayo in, uh, in Peru. And uh, this, of course, is a first step of understanding the system and then sort of to discuss with the city uh, uh, and the private sectors, the operators, first of all, how the city can improve sort of its traffic or transport management based on the data. And secondly, of finding interventions sort of that will make the supply uh, uh, sort of better. So here we use data collection methods, uh, digital data collection me uh, methods as have been uh, presented in this, um, uh, in this session sort of to basically find, identify and develop projects. Thank you very much. Dirk, thanks a lot. That's, um, oh, thank you all very much. Now um, I hand over to Carolina for, for some final words of wisdom. Carolina, we heard dich nicht. I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> there was an airplane like passing, then I have to mute my microphone. I forgot to turn it on. But well, thank you very much to everybody for this spectacular and incredible session that we had today. And I have some few points to, for me and I think for everybody to take away for today's sessions. First, I think cities are being innovative by using tools to manage traffic and avoid the use of private vehicles carpooling, ride sharing, and the use of that application to stay tuned on the mobility partners will help ease commuting in cities. I am glad to see that cycling is seen more often known, not as an alternative uh, mean of transportation, but as an actual mean of transport for cities. And I would like to point out a bullet from Lahti presentations where Mrs. Bruno mentioned that one of the strategies to promote cycling is keep paths clean on winter. And that could sound simple, but data has shown that keeping pedestrian paths and cycling paths clear in winter is a key gender sensitive measure to increase the participation of women in active modes, and therefore reduce the use of motorized means by providing accessible mobility to all. I constantly hear in the second block, fast and efficient and accessible for all. And there it comes technology solutions at the center of planning by offering data availability to help visualize the multiple patterns of mobility in cities. 
And tech can involve the actual apps technology, but also open data to let citizens participate and analyze and also provide solutions. And as said, uh, Dennis from Trophy, hackathons are great to get ideas and translate them into public policies to make transportation fast, efficient and accessible for all. And finally, from the finance sector, we learned that multilateral banks are committed to shift to sustainable mobility and more keen to support projects that incorporate digitalization aspects that help improve commuting in cities. So I think this is a strong message to start thinking about including digitalization in the planning processes of our transport projects. So this is all. Thank you very much to all and to all our special guests and also to my colleague Andre in Berlin and to all the backstage support that we have today. And please stay tuned with the next session of the TCC Week 2021 and see you next time. Thank you, Carolina. Thank you so much. So um, everything is said, everything is done. Two more things I would like to do and to say. So um, uh, it's not the end. It's not the end. So after the sessions, there will be a breakout room. So we, uh, the link is or the or the, uh, uh, the click is on the on the home page. It's a breakout room where you can go and mingle with participants and and uh, and the viewers of this of this um, of the session, where you can exchange contacts, where you can discuss further. So please do this. Please do. It's it's really good for for networking, um, and, and and it's really good fun. The second thing I would like to add is that um, also please stay for the hydrogen hour. So hydrogen is the future in many, many arts of the, business, uh, uh, of the industry. So um, European Union is going to spend enormous amount of, uh, of cash to move into hydrogen economy. Even so that personal transport is probably uh, won by um, by, 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 the, uh, by the cars, by the electric cars, but there are still a lot, many, many uses for hydrogen. So please stay and join us, well, <laughs> different moderators, obviously, uh, to join, to join uh, the GIZ on this field to, to explore the opportunities that, can, that come with, um, with hydrogen. And now, what can I say? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>